Hello, 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 geeks and geekettes. It's Wednesday morning. Let's see how much trouble I can get in this week. <laughs> uh, I'm going to run my mouth someday and cause my own demise. <laughs> well, if it hasn't happened by now, I don't think it ever will. It's not a challenge. It's just a fact. Um, okay, King Kong asks, one of my favorite works of yours is your 12-issue Richard Dragon run. Well, I was wondering how you would rank DC's greatest fighters. For me, it is Batman, Bane, Richard Dragon, Cassandra Cain, and Shiva. Well, actually, I wrote an entire uh, crossover. Uh, it was an easy crossover to write because I wrote every issue and it crossed over into uh, the four titles I was writing at the time at DC. From Detective to Robin to Nightwing to Green Arrow. Um, and it, the purpose of this arc was to answer that very question. Who is the best martial artist in the DCU? And uh, this is my ranking. So here we go. It was called Brotherhood of the Monkey Fist, by the way. Number one, I would have to rank Lady Shiva. Well, I did rank Lady Shiva as number one. Uh, she's the, you know, she's one of those holy crap characters. When she shows up, you know it's getting real. And uh, she established way back when Denny O'Neill created her, the original Richard Dragon Kung Fu Fighter run. And, uh, hold on now. She's, um, she's quite formidable. <laughs> and deadly and nasty. So I put her at number one, the most accomplished martial artist in the DCU. And it's not a girl power thing. Uh, I think it was always understood by Denny. And I always, I followed his lead whenever I could. I liked to follow the leads of the creators of characters. And it was his idea that she was the deadliest hands of Kung Fu in the DCU. Now, in my uh, crossover, I had her fight to a standstill with Connor Hawk. So I'm going to put Connor Hawk at number two. Um, when I took on Connor Hawk, he was already established. He was a martial artist. And it was my decision that he not be as good a bowman as his dad, Oliver Queen. Oliver Queen, at, the, at, at that time in the DCU, it was uh, determined that Oliver Queen's ability with a bow was a metahuman ability. In other words, he really was a superhero. And his superpower was incredibly ac incredible accuracy with either thrown weapons or weapons fired from a um, stringed weapon. Um, Connor didn't inherit those abilities, uh, but because he was raised in a monastery, we, you know, well, we all know that if you're raised in an Asian monastery, you must become a master martial artist. That's just, it's the law. And so he came out of that... Uh, you know, with a lot of schooling in various disciplines, and very good. He's a, he's a much better fighter than Connor or than uh, Oliver Queen, and in my estimation, a much better fighter than everybody in the DCU except for Shiva. And that was my conclusion. Now I got to give it to Richard Dragon, uh, the number three slot, because again, created by Denny O'Neill, created to be one of the leading lights of the uh, martial arts world within the DCU. So you got you got to give it. Got to give it to the dragon. I bring up Bronze Tiger as number four, another Denny O'Neill creation. Uh, Bronze Tiger and Richard Dragon were seen as, you know, equals in their ability. Uh, and so, you know, if Dragon is uh, number three, it only stands the reason that Bronze Tiger is number four. And, uh, yeah, I'll give you Batman. I'll give you Batman at number five. Uh, not a naturally talented, you know, self-made man, not a naturally talented martial artist, but, you know, he stuck with it <laughs> until he was a apt pu pupil in all the empty hand fighting arts. And uh, given his record of wins, I would, you know, you got to give the guy uh, a spot in the top five, right? It's only fair. Giarnuto, <laughs> you are probably most known for writing Conan, Moon Knight, Punisher, Robin, Batman, Nightwing, Batgirl, Black Canary, Huntress, Catwoman, Guy Gardner, Green Arrow, Sigil, and Crux. Did you actively seek these characters out to write, or did the job start out helping editors out of a pinch? 
Also, were you a fan of the character's titles prior, and what particular issues by writers other than yourself for these titles were favorite standouts for you? Um, yeah, Conan, I'm going to just run down the list. Conan, I solicited for. This, this is going to be a big list uh, entry in Ask Chuck Dixon. I didn't design it this way. It's just the, the most recent batch of questions had a bunch of lists in them. And uh, if I believe the internet, people love lists. So Conan, I solicited for. Uh, I, I bugged Larry Hama and bugged him and bugged him and bugged him. It, 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 the bugging took the form of giving him pitches all the time. Uh, I was working on Cull, uh, King Cull backups in Savage Sword, and I desperately wanted to write some of the lead features. And so I kept bothering Larry by pitching stories to him. And Larry would get aggravated and say, I already have Conan writers. So I was like, I, I know, but I want to be one of them. Uh, and eventually... He, um, he, he, he made me the, the lead writer on, on um, the Conan feature in Savage Sword of Conan. And I, I held that slot, you know, off and on. We had other writers, but I was the most uh, prevalent writer there for about five years. And um, it was fun. I, and, and did I like Conan before? Yeah, I liked Conan, Conan a whole lot. And Larry knew that I understood the character. I was conversant with the character. I liked it. And I had something to contribute. So, um, and, you know, he teamed me up with Gary Kloppis for the first time. A number of other artists worked with me on it, but Gary was the standout. And uh, we're still friends to this day, still uh, collaborate to this day. Uh, Robin, I did not solicit for. I was called by Denny O'Neill. They were looking for a writer to write Tim Drake. And Denny had read my Airboy work, and he liked it. He liked how I wrote a young kid as a hero. And he asked me if I wanted to take a, a spin at this. And I did, with, with his encouragement. At first, I was a bit reticent. I wasn't sure I liked the Robin character enough. Uh, you know, now, obviously, I love the Robin character. Uh, until Denny explained Robin's importance in the Batman mythos to me. And, uh, you know, I handed in a storyline. He liked it. And the rest is history. I went on to write three miniseries, many annuals, specials, Robin Year One, and 100 issues of his monthly title, uh, and a few other disparate projects here and there featuring the Boy Wonder. Uh, Moon Knight, Carl Potts came to me and asked me if I wanted to write it. He wanted Mark Spector only, no multiple personalities, and so the, the the alter ego of Moon Knight would have a military background. Carl knew that I would do the homework that I liked writing that kind of stuff, and so he offered it to me. And uh, he was the editor, I think, for the first year before Danny Fingeroth took over and uh, wrote it for two years, but it, it was brought to me. It was not a character I ever thought about writing. Uh, I, I'd read all the stuff by Doug Mensch, uh, those Bilson Kevich stories, and, and I enjoyed them, but I never thought about writing the character until Carl approached me. And again, I had to think about it for a while. And I thought, yeah, I, I can see a way into this. Mark Spector, a mercenary, you know, he's uh, idle now. He's no longer a mercenary. He's no longer being paid to be a soldier. He's, and he's a, he's a man of action. He's a, a doer. And so he, you know, finds his way into this Moon Knight persona. Uh, Batman? No, never thought about writing Batman. Never thought about it. Uh, then he asked me on the strength of the sales of my first Robin miniseries to write an arc for Batman. Um, I was intimidated. I was scared. I was, you know, you know, uh, this is my first Batman story. It may very well be my only one, especially if I screw it up. And, uh, but then he was very happy with the results. And, you know, eventually, maybe, I think maybe a year later, uh, would offer me detective, uh, the, the, the regular writer slot of detective. Again, uh, that was something I was offered, not something I solicited. For because everybody wants to write Batman. I mean, if you want to write comics, Batman is the character you want to write. And I thought, well, I'm never going to compete for that character because it's a crowded field. Everybody wants to write for him. But it turned out I ended up writing more Batman than anybody else uh, because Denny liked my stuff. And he, you know, sort of plucked me from obscurity <laughs> to write the greatest comic book character who ever lived. 
um, ever lived. He doesn't live. The, the greatest comic book character in existence. Um, Nightwing, again, I, I didn't solicit to write Nightwing. Uh, the monthly Nightwing series was to be written by Denny O'Neill and Alan Grant. For whatever reason, they changed their minds about it. And uh, Scott Peterson, who was, to be the, who was editor on it, tapped me. He said, would you be interested in writing it? And I said, well, who's going to be drawing it? It's always my first question. I said, Scott McDaniel. I had seen some recent Scott McDaniel work that really impressed me. You know, I was knocked out by it. And I thought, well, yeah, okay, let's go for it. And, uh, but again, it's not a character I thought about writing. Not a character I bug them about. Um, Batgirl, in both iterations, uh, Batgirl year one, I, I solicited along with Scott Beatty to write that. And uh, that was a project we sought out, we pitched for, and you know, we mapped out everything we were going to do. It was, it was quite a uh, detailed outline. It's unusual for me. Uh, I'm terrible at pitching is the reason why most of my assignments are handed to me. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have had as much comic work as I did. I'm terrible at pitches. Archie Goodwin once said in an editorial meeting that he had a pitch by me, but it was lame. It was a bad pitch. But he said, but, but does it matter? We all know Chuck sucks at pitches, but he always delivers in the scripts. And so that was that was the book on me at DC, that I would deliver in the script. I just wasn't very good at selling myself or selling my story. But I'd sweat that story. I'd make sure that story was good, even though uh, I wasn't very terrific at hyping it. Uh, Black Canary, I ended up writing Birds of Prey again. Jordan Gorfinkel sought me out. Uh, he... He spent a lot of time, you know, trying to sell me on the idea of Birds of Prey. I didn't see it at first. And, and then uh, we did a one shot. And within six pages of the scripting, I realized, yeah, yeah, Gorf is right. There's a chemistry between these characters. I really like them. Uh, there's some potential for this book. And then Gorf kind of became the, the mother of the Birds of Prey. Uh, he kept pushing the book forward until it finally got a monthly. And now... You know, TV show, movies, all the rest of it. Uh, but that's all thanks to Gorf. I mean, it was his original concept uh, all the way down the line. He just brought me on to develop it and dramatize it and populate it with interesting characters. So, uh, again, an another character I never planned on writing. Uh, Huntress, yeah, Huntress I did. I, you know, Huntress was kind of a forgotten character by the time I was on Detective. And in one of my first stories with Graham Nolan and I suggested bringing her back. I got a little bit of pushback, not from Denny, but from some of the younger editors. Like, well, why do you want her? You know? And I thought, well, I said, well, I really like that original run with um, Joe Staten and, and Joey Cavalieri uh, of, um, of The Huntress. Uh, the Helena Bertinelli version of The Huntress. You know, uh, mafia princess turned dark vigilante. I said, I really dig that. And I, and I, 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 the chemistry between her and the more quote unquote legitimate vigilantes in Gotham, like Batman and Robin, um, would be interesting, be an interesting dynamic. You know, would Batman approve of her, or disapprove of her? And uh, in my writing, he was always changing his mind about, about the Huntress. But I, you know, I, I want to want you know, I, I'm glad I brought the Huntress back into the Batman family. And uh, it's, I, I think it's one of my better contributions or, or uh, more uh, resonant contributions. Catwoman, again, I was, they ran into some problems and I was asked to write a few issues. If you look at my Catwoman run, it's frequently interrupted by other writers. Uh, so each time you see me on Catwoman, it's because um, there was, uh, you know, the bench was empty. <laughs> there was nobody else to write it and usually I only had I had a very short window to write it and Jim Ballant being a speedy speedy artist uh, you know I had to race to keep up with him sometimes but it um, again not a character I ever thought about writing but I really enjoyed it I really enjoyed it um, it's a high story every issue in my mind I mean she's a thief she's the, one of the more well adjusted comic book characters and uh, she's fun to write because she's um, a character who enjoys her, what she is and what she does. 
Uh, Guy Gardner, another character, uh, Kevin Dooley was editor at the time, came to me and said, we want to, our sales on Guy Gardner's monthly are pretty sad. We want to go in a different direction. He suggested a Guy Gardner year one, Guy Gardner origin. And uh, so I went at it and I said, yes, because Joe Staten was the artist. I quit the book because Joe Staten was no, no longer the artist. But uh, Kevin kept that from me for a few months. But uh, again, not a character I wanted to write, but a character I often thought about because, because he was portrayed as politically conservative, uh, most writers wrote him as a, as a mouth-breathing idiot. And I thought, well, that's not a fair uh, summation. Uh, they were writing from a, a uh, place of prejudice against people that didn't believe, agree with them politically. And I thought, no, I, you know, and year one, his year one, his origin, his beginnings gave me an opportunity to explain who this guy is and why he thinks the way he does and, and you know, what he's about. And he's very far from an idiot. Is he brash? Is he blunt? You know, is he sometimes rude and crude? Yeah, but, you know, he's a slob hero. We love slob heroes. I think America invented the slob hero. Connor Hawk, again. I was brought in as a pitch hitter. Um, Kelly Puckett, amazing, amazing comic book writer, was writing the series at the time. And uh, for whatever reason, Kelly had to leave the book. Uh, he created Connor Hawk. He set up the relationship between Connor and Ollie and Eddie Fires. Uh, and, they, they did, and I had done one fill-in issue to help. I think, I think it was to help Kelly out. And I did like an inventory issue. It's not very good. If you look up my first issue, it's Oliver Queen. I think it involves um, the, the villainous in it is pushing a, a deadly diet supplement. I mean, you know, they didn't give me much time to write it. And I was stuck for ideas. And I, I thought they'd never have me back. <laughs> and, but they did. So they ran into a, some problems and they called me in and asked me if I wanted to write the, the book. And I said, I'll write it for six months until you, I'll give you time to find somebody else. And I ended up getting into it, and I wrote it for um, for three years, 36 issues. So, um, yeah, another character I never thought about writing. Again, Sigil, when I got the cross-gen, Sigil was assigned to me. Uh, it had been written by Mark Wade before, and I, I don't know, I don't think Mark started the book. I think maybe Barbara Kiesel started Sigil, and then Mark took it over, and then I got it. And um, I, I'd never read the book. I had to read all the issues uh, so that I could get started, because they had artists waiting to get to work. And uh, I dug it. I dug it. It's like straight up, um, straight up space opera, a more testosterone-driven Star Wars kind of thing. And uh, I dug it, you know, doing the aliens and everything else. And I got to work with Scott Eaton and Drew Hennessy every month. And that was a blast. Those guys were terrific. They were just a lot of fun to hang out with, a lot of fun to work with. And uh, good times, good times. Crux is another one. I inherited it from Mark Wade. I inherited this one earlier in the run. I forget what issue. And um, Mark Wade admitted to me that he created this book in a time it took him to drive from his apartment to the CrossGen Studios. <laughs> oh, and he said, this character is this, and this character is that, and it was all DC characters. It was all a CrossGen version of different disparate DC characters. It had this confusing backstory about Atlantis and everything else, and I just, quite frankly, looked at it as a uh, Monster of the Month kind of comic. Uh, what kind of challenge am I going to introduce for these characters? How am I going to make the readers care about them? And uh, the biggest boon to doing it and what made it painless was Steve Epting was the artist. Uh, and Steve's just, just a great guy, just a consummate pro. Uh, I, I asked him to draw a lot of wacky stuff, and he, he did an awesome job on all of it. Um, and uh, But my plan when I first got to CrossGen, I, I had to meet with each of my artists. And uh, I, I said to Steve, I said, I've got a, a, a one-year plan. I said, my, you're going to do Crux for another year, and then we're going to do a pirate book. <laughs> so, and I can find somebody else to do Crux. I said, because frankly, you're wasted on this title. 
Uh, both Sigil and even more so Crux were deeply tied into the Sigil verse, the Uber story, which was the ultimate downfall of Cross Gen because they had this big overarching story that all of the comics, you know, um, were like a piece of like a jigsaw puzzle, and and Crux was very much the center of it, and it really hurt the book. I mean, there was only so much you could do, and. Um, the reveals of the cross gen universe, they were just too far apart. There wasn't enough happening in the early years to make you see the big picture. And ultimately, I didn't find the big picture all that interesting. Uh, but, you know, I did, I enjoyed the book. I, I, I learned to like the characters. And of course, I loved working with Steve. So there you go. Most of them I was asked to write. I'm a lucky, lucky guy, and I admit it. You know, I didn't have to go begging or knocking on doors very much once I got into the business, once I proved my reliability. Uh, and, um, you know, they came to me for many, many years. The phone would ring. Very cool. Bob the Hun. Thoughts on them having Superman raped? <laughs> Not kidding, this really happened. They had Superman depowered and raped. Some people think this is payback for the way female superheroes have been treated before. Well, that would be equity, wouldn't it? That's what equity means now. It means payback. It means we're going to make things more fair by being less fair for a little while. So if you're an oppressed minority that you feel you've been oppressed for centuries, well, we're going to oppress your oppressor for a few more centuries, and then it'll all be even up. Because that's how human nature works, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you ever hear the expression, the shoes on the other foot? No, none of these people, have, they, they don't learn anything. You know, they, they remember everything, they don't learn anything. So anyway, yeah, Superman being raped. Hey, I'm uncomfortable, particularly DC, how female characters are treated. I mean, you look back at the history of DC with a... With a uh, unbiased eye with a jaundiced eye, and you will see that female characters come off very poorly in the DC universe. And uh, this wouldn't be the first time a character was raped uh, in a comic. I, I remember being very upset in Burns' run when it was implied that Big Barda had been raped. And I, I just like, what, what the hell? This isn't what I read comic books for. You know, I, I don't read anything to read about rape. I don't want to read about rape. It's not entertainment to me. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't get it. And why would you do that? Is that the headline you want? Is that what you want them reading out on the NBC nightly news? Hey, Superman got raped. Um, uh, who wants to read about that? Nobody I know, nobody I want to know. I, you know, it's like they, they hate the characters. They hate the fans. Now, I've, had, I've said this a number of times recently in these videos, and a number of you uh, have responded by saying, oh, they don't hate the fans. I mean, they have to make money. Well, they're not making money. They're not making any money doing this kind of material because they've chased away anybody who cares about these characters anymore, who wants to read about them, unadulterated, you know, unadulterated wish fulfillment adventure characters. Nobody's wish fulfillment is getting raped. So, uh, you know, or humiliated or any other way. So, yeah, if it was about making money, they'd make better comics. So I don't want to hear they don't hate the readers, they don't hate the characters. Uh, because, you know, you and I, most of us, we love these characters. You don't want to see anything horrible happen to Superman or Batman or Spider-Man or the Human Torch or... Sue Storm or any of these characters because you love them. And that's where the adventure comes in, isn't it? That's where the suspense comes in because there's a potential of harm for these characters and that's what keeps you reading. You know, um, Batman could be shot full of holes any night he leaves the Batcave and that's part of the allure. You know, this guy's out on the edge. Now, we don't want to see him get shot to death we kind of know when we read them that he's never going to get gunned down. But still, we want to see him triumph over evil. We want to, that's, that's what these characters are about. They're about triumph, triumphing over evil, not being victims of evil. Um, now, it's okay if a Superman gets Superman or 
you know, Daredevil or whatever getting beaten down once in a while. It's okay for them to lose once in a while, but not to that degree. You know, what the hell are you thinking when that's what you think the readers want to read? And, and the truth is, is, they know that's not what the readers want to read. They don't care what the readers want to read. They simply want to, they're, they're simply creatively bankrupt, or there's some reason why they want to show these characters with feet of clay. Now, they'll say, well, this will humanize the character. Well, I know lots of people that are human, and I think they're human, and I sympathize with them and can relate to them, and they weren't raped, you know. Um, if you can't think of a better way to make Superman relatable, why don't you get another job or, or go for that PhD? Go back to school. Do something. But get the hell away from comics because you're ruining them. You're burning them down. Uh, I, you know, if you want to comment that I'm wrong, that this is this is the new business model, go ahead. But think about it. What you're saying makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Absolutely not. Okay, Sean Thompson, are you a fan of Stephen Hunter and his Bob Lee Swagger books? Hunter is one of us, quote unquote, and a gun guy. And those books are a hell of a lot of fun. I have wondered for a long time why no one has tried to adapt these into a comic book. Probably because they wouldn't make any money. Probably because he sold the rights to, you know, Warners. And they're never going to do that. Uh, have you ever met him or had any thoughts about the character in comic form? All we ever got was the lame Marky Mark movie from over a decade ago, and it was awful. I've read a couple of Stephen Hunter novels. My favorite is Master Sniper. And I wish... They were all like Master Sniper. Master Sniper has this incredible fla flashback sequence about a German sniper during World War II, uh, and he's like up in a bell tower uh, when the Russians are closing in. And his job is to sl slow the Russian advance to buy time for the German troops who are retreating. And it's an incredibly written action sequence. I mean, it's, it's, it's apocalyptic and suspenseful and everything else. And it's the best thing I've ever read by Stephen Hunter. I, unfortunately for me, the rest of his writing doesn't live up to that extended flashback sequence. Um, I can see the appeal. I understand the appeal. To me, um, the writing is a little too on the nose. Um, there's not enough to interest me about the character. He's not conflict. You know, Swagger isn't conflicted in any way. Now I don't mean flawed. I don't mean he wets the bed or cries himself to sleep at night. I just mean I want a little bit more something in the character. You know, uh, about what drives him or what uh, what's at stake. What risks he's taking other than risking his own life. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can see why people like them. I mean, I know a lot of people who are big fans. And, and the guy can certainly write. It's just... Not for me. The, the reason might be because it's so close to stuff I write that I'm like, okay, this is so, you know, close to the kind of stuff I was doing, particularly at the time when I was reading stuff in The Punisher, that maybe I don't want this guy in my head because I might, you know, we're so close on the material, we're writing in the same area so much that I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be influenced by the work. Uh, same reason I've never read a Lee Child novel or a Brad Thor novel because I don't want them in my head when I'm writing Levon Cade because uh, you know I don't want to uh, unconsciously imitate or uh, I, I don't want to even know what they're about I don't even want to know anything about them because you know to me you know Levon Cade exists in a, in a unique universe that I don't want to be touched by anybody else if that makes any sense at all. Uh, but same thing with Stephen Hunter. It was just too close to the kind of stuff I write. And you're and you're you're, you're right about Shooter, the the Mark Wahlberg movie. Um, I call it uh, Dick Cheney must die because <laughs> basically that seemed to be the plot of the story, that they were out to kill a, a, a character who looked very much like Dick Cheney. So um, let's move on. Bill Usher, what are your favorite manga? I told you there were lists. For lots of lists. Uh, well, I'll go with my top five here, and there's probably others I'm forgetting about. And there's one manga I have no idea what the name of it is. <laughs> so I can't even tell you about it. I don't even know how to Google it. 
Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll scan some pages and show you next time. Gogol 13 is the first manga I really got into when I used to go up uh, in the 70s to interview at the comic book companies and I would stop by the uh, the uh, Kina Kaniya uh, bookstore that was right near DC's offices and um, Google 13 was the first manga that really attracted me uh, Duke Togo is a professional assassin and he gets involved in these fantastic well researched ripped from the headlines kind of adventures I mean, if there's a mystery about who killed, uh, you know, the premier of, uh, you know, Bundy, you're going to find out it was Duke Togo. Uh, he's, you know, he's this shadow figure. Uh, sometimes it's espionage. Sometimes it's underworld. Sometimes it's heist. Sometimes it's just pure adventure, you know, at the top of the world kind of stuff. And uh, it, just, it just varies from, like, hard-boiled crime to Alistair McLean type adventures. They're all meticulously drawn, well-researched. Uh, thankfully, a number of them, not enough of them, but a number of them have been translated into English. And to me, I, I, I reread about 10 of them in a row recently. I'd read them before, but I, I just wanted to read another one, uh, even though I'd, I'd read it um, a couple of years ago. And I ended up going through them, like, salted peanuts uh it's 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 just an addictive series i have a whole bunch of them in japanese and um thankfully to the creator uh even in japanese i can, I can somewhat follow the story I can certainly follow the action scenes he does the some of the best action set pieces in comics just really complex really just really well written like thinking man's action kind of stories of course astro boy uh, I had a full set of Astro Boy in Japanese uh, for years, and then Dark Horse republished them in almost the same format in English, so I finally got to read them. And uh, I just, you know, I, I dig Tezuka overall, but I, I really like Astro Boy. Um, fun, inventive, crazy stuff. Even by today's standards, uh, Tezuka's imagination is pretty much unmatched. Uh, he's up there with Kirby as far as the making... You know, taking any kind of insanely uh, odd idea and making it work perfectly within a story. And, of course, Astro Boy is in, in Professor Elephant and all the rest of them. They're lovable characters. And I, I dig the drawing. For a long time, I was such a Tezuka devotee when I was trying to be a, an artist that, you know, I was aping him heavy, doing a lot of uh, Tezuka-type drawings. But uh, terrific artist, terrific writer. Um, Senpai, I'm going to mess up this name. Shurkichi, I think. It's Senpai Shurkichi. I, I've mentioned this a lot of times. It's a fishing manga. And it is so beautifully drawn and beautifully told. Um, I, I don't know that it's ever been translated into English. Closest I got was some Portuguese editions. Um, but I love it. I love it. And the stories, even more so than Google 13, are perfectly readable, even though I don't read Japanese, um, because the stories are just so wonderfully told. And it's the simplest thing in the world. It's this kid, and I believe it's his grandfather, and then some other guy, this really cool guy who was like a master fisherman they hung, hang out with, and they just go all around the world fishing. I don't know where they get their money or why, but they're, they're fishing. All kinds of fishing, and I know nothing about fishing. But, you know, surf casting. There's, my favorite story is surf casting. They're standing on the beach fishing. It's a terrific story. Surf casting, you know, angling, deep sea fishing, all kinds of stuff. And um, I guess if you're into fishing, you know, it's, it's an awesome thing. Because, uh, again, meticulously researched. But I love this guy's style. I mean, uh, look at the animation in that character. And, you know, um, the, the attention to detail of that fish. I mean, uh, the action is just crazy. The, this guy, the only artist I've ever seen who picks as wild an angle to draw things from as, as the guy who draws this is uh, Scott McDaniel. You know, you get these panels and there's like, you know, 15 to 20 points of perspective all in this one panel. And, and all it is is guys pulling fish out of a, out of a mountain stream. <laughs> but, but I love it. I love it. I wish there were some in English. Okay, Vinland Saga, which I discovered in English. It's one I'm currently reading. I think I'm up to volume eight. 
and it is a I mentioned it before here it's a Viking story uh, not the usual stuff that you would think of for a Japanese manga and once again meticulously researched uh, yes it's a manga which you wouldn't think was particularly suited to telling a story about Vikings but it is you know I learned recently that the artist and writer was just a huge fan from from a child of anything having to do with the medieval Viking era and it's it's uh, really violent and but it's also touching uh, the court intrigue I find interesting and I usually don't find that stuff interesting but it's so well done and the motives are so clear and the risks and what at stake are so well laid out and I like that the story takes its time it's never boring but the story takes its time and you'll see the characters are literally separated from each other for years within the story and you'll see what each character has been doing during those years and you know forming new relationships meeting new challenges and um, just a marvelously epic I mean epic in the true sense story because it spans decades and it's just huge enormous ensemble cast and there's a lot of payoff and a lot of great reveals it's just a terrific series and it it, it hews pretty close to history the, the real history um, and I, I highly recommend it it's, it's in these beautiful hardcover compilations that um, you know I'm digging it upon the recommendation of several people here uh, in the comments section I'm checking out Berserk which at first I'm like why the heck am I reading this and then I got into it I could see why people like it uh, that little fairy character oh my god geez, this character is going to get annoying and then I, I, I fell in love with that character and uh, it is a seriously strange fantasy epic uh, apparently set in Europe it's got like a European background but it's got that that element of weirdness that only manga can have and it's one of these you know big guy nearly invincible fighting the world kind of things you know fist of the north star you know those kind of characters uh but it's it's really really dark it's a really really dark fantasy uh the lead character is not a nice guy by any stretch of the imagination you seriously you don't know where this guy's going or what he's going to do next and I guess that's why I keep reading it. But uh, again, uh, Dark Horse has put it out in these big oversized hardcovers, these big, big fat compilations that, uh, you know, are compulsive reading. So those are my top five favorite mangas. And I'm sure we'll get lots of comments because people like hearing about the manga. I guess manga is like really popular, huh? I guess like one manga sells more than all of DC and Marvel's output a month here in the United States. God knows what it sells in Japan. Uh, there's probably, I mean, there are some manga in Japan that there are probably more, there are probably less people who aren't reading that particular manga than are. Uh, I can't even imagine that kind of success for an American comic book creator. Uh, but good for you. Good for you, manga, because you listen to your audience and give them what they want, unlike uh, our comic book publishers. Lefty Knox, one. Do you think it's acceptable for writers to have Batman attempt to kill under certain circumstances? Or is it the same thing as Batman actually succeeding at killing, where it would be too character-breaking? Do you know if these types of stories were ever pitched to Denny O'Neill? If so, how did he respond to them? <laughs> okay, originally Bob Kane and, and uh, um, Bill Finger uh, had Batman killing people, you know? He, 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 as it says in this panel, I'm afraid this time it's necessary. Uh, so that solves a lot of problems for Batman, but it, in the end, doesn't make for a very interesting story. And like the Punisher, uh, you end up with no recurring villains because you've killed everybody. Uh, I don't like Batman killing people. Batman shouldn't kill people. I like that he evolved into a character like Superman who found another way. Uh, who, who uh, even though he's an outlaw vigilante, still adheres to the law. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of that at all. I mean, I've, I've had Batman characters kill people. Uh, Nightwing 
killed Joker at the end of the last laugh, and wow, Batman was not happy about that. Uh, you know, and I've dealt with this issue in, in Batman's Devil's Advocate and things like that. I would not want to see Batman kill anyone because when I take on a character, especially one a legacy character like this that's been around forever and it's a certain thing is established about them, I'm never going to change that certain thing just for the sake of a story or just for the sake of, look what I did. I had Batman kill someone. You know, uh, I had Robin kiss a boy. Yay! Uh, what's the purpose of that other than to draw attention to your own work? Uh, I like to draw attention to my own work by doing good work and telling good stories. Actually, I don't want to draw any attention to myself. That's the point, I guess. I just want people to like my stories. I don't write my stories so people go, hey, he's a good writer. I write my stories so people go, hey, that was a good story. And they don't give a crap who wrote it. They just like the story. So I'm not into Batman killing people or Superman killing people. I think it's ridiculous. These are characters that work around those little problems in their life. And, um, yeah, if you propose a story to Denny O'Neill, uh, where Batman kills somebody, he, would, he, he wouldn't he would literally kick your ass, but he would verbally kick your ass. And safe to say, y you would never get a job in the Batman offices as long as he was editor. Because uh, he was in agreement with me, Batman should not kill. Senior Jack Connor Artist Morrison. Okay. Hey, Chuck, is the writing important or the artwork? Because I am a comic book artist because I don't write first, but draw first. Which one should I start first? Well, if you want to start drawing first, if you're the artist, then start drawing first. You know, uh, why not? To me, the artist writer is the purest form of comics. So, so go for it. But which is more important? Both are more important. Both are equally important. There isn't one that's more important than the other. Comics are a words and picture medium. The words are important. And the art is important. Now, the art seems to take precedence because it's a visual medium. You know, you look at the page, you see the artwork first, not the words. But if the words aren't any good, the artwork makes no sense. So you need a story. And for that, you need a writer. It may very well be yourself, but you need someone to write the story. You need interesting characters with motivations uh, that are relatable, that have a past, a future. There's risks involved. There's stakes involved. There's something happening to make you care. And if you just write stories where cool characters are posing and punching each other, you end up with image comics, the early days of image comics, where, yes, the art was really, really pretty to look at, but you could you, you didn't give a damn about the characters. Uh, you've got to care about the story. You've got to care what happens next. And that requires a writer. And like I said, it, be it yourself or someone else. But the story's got to start somewhere. The story's got to be put down so that you... Um, um, have a framework to follow. I, artists all the time ask me for scripts because they know that if they do sample pages out of their own head, there's something lacking there. That there's they haven't been challenged. Uh, they're going to draw what they like to draw best or draw what's easiest for them. Uh, but people serious about getting the comic book industry realize that sometimes you have to draw stuff you've never drawn before or that you don't like drawing. And so artists will ask me, and I get this request quite a bit, and you're perfectly welcome to contact me uh, with a requ this request, and I'll send them past scripts that I've done, and they'll do sample pages based on those pages. And they're always more satisfied with that because uh, it's more like an assignment, and it's more like I didn't have to think about what to draw, I was told what to draw, which is what a writer in comics does. He tells the artist what to draw, doesn't tell them how to draw it, uh, he just says, this is what's necessary for the story. And then you're off to the races. Uh, it's a collaborative medium. It's a medium with immediate experience. The immediate experience is the art. The lasting experience is the story. It's the, and, and that's not to say the writer's more important. It's, it's the writer and the artist working in tandem, literally on the same page, working, using their 
disparate skills applied to the comic um, to create something really, really special. And that's what I believe comics are. And I, that's what I believe comics always can be. But if you get into which is more important, you know, the chicken or the egg, uh, you're not approaching the medium correctly. It's, it, you're not understanding it. But as a, as a writer artist, if you want to start drawing, you just say, hey, I got this great idea for this sequence. Well, then do that. Do that, you know, and then come back to it later. And, and trust me, while you're drawing it, you're going to think of story stuff because uh, every artist does. You know, your mind sort of wanders to the work. Uh, it, it wanders further than the page you're drawing, and you, you're thinking... I've, I've had some terrific conversations with artists about characters, and their approach is always fresh. It's a perspective I didn't think of, because they're thinking of it visually, and they're spending a lot of time with these characters. Uh, I mean, I feel like I have an affinity for my characters. I have a, a closeness to them because I'm writing them, but I think an artist has even more so, because they're they're visualizing them in in in, in what in their mind is a real world. Uh, just just like the real to me real universe i've created in my head for these characters to exist in so hope i didn't get too esoteric or obtuse there uh cory brown when you have a story for a character you simply can't use how much do you change to keep from getting sued but still keep the premise on point did you ever have a story for example in moon knight that started as an unused story for batman or ideas in cross gen that started as ideas elsewhere yeah, not really. I mean, um, maybe elements. I've used elements, but I've never done. I know. I know there are, are writers who have like pitched a Batman story and it got rejected, so they went over to Marvel and pitched it as a Spider-Man story and it got accepted, and vice versa. Um, I, I, I've never done that actively. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there might be elements I think of that I didn't get to use, and I think, well, I can use this element, but not. But I can't think of an entire story except, um, you know, in, in, in rare instances where, but, but to me, these characters aren't interchangeable at all. And, and certainly the rogues galleries aren't. So um, to me, a Batman story is very specifically a Batman story. A Daredevil story would very specifically be a Daredevil story. But the one time I can think of it is, is uh, when I was invited to submit um, an idea for a rewrite of the third act of Expendables 2, uh, I submitted a rather detailed treatment um, and uh, I ended up not, not getting the job, not working on it, but and they didn't use any of my ideas, so I thought, well, I'm not going to let this go to waste. So pretty much my setup for Expendables 2 uh, became a G.I. Joe arc called Deep Terror, uh, and I used a lot of the elements um, instead of, um, oh, who's the bad guy in Expendables? So Van Damme. Instead of Van Damme having a, you know, um, a, a, a mining operation in some faraway land, uh, it was Cobra. And um, it, Deep Terror includes my, my epic conclusion, the one I tried to sell the producers on, of uh, that would, would have had um, Sly and Van Damme fighting atop one of those massive mining vehicles, subterranean mining vehicles, and while they're fighting, they, they don't realize that it's in motion. They realize it's in motion, but they don't realize it's it's slowly rolling to the edge of a chasm as they fight. Uh, but I got to do that in deep terror. So I got to use the idea. So I have repurposed stories, but let's face it, uh, there's not a lot of daylight between the premise for the Expendables and the premise of G.I. Joe. So it fit. I didn't, really didn't have to change anything. Uh, Plot-wise. Unknown Passenger. What do you think of Denny O'Neill's The Question Run and how different it was from Ditko's original vision of the character, especially taking into account Stephen Denny's, Denny's radically different ideologies? Yes, they were radically different. Uh, Ditko's um, version is, you know, man of mystery, uh, guy out writing wrongs. Vic Sage was a... Um, was he a TV reporter or is a newspaper reporter? And he, uh, maybe I'm getting that wrong. I'm going to get a million comments if I got that wrong. Uh, but Vic Sage was, uh, he, he wasn't getting anywhere in his normal life. So he becomes the question in order to right wrongs and, and bring justice 
in a way that he didn't see he could effectively or legally do in his daytime job. Uh, so in that way, it was very much like a lot of Ditko characters. Um, the guy's got a secret persona. He goes out on the streets and gets even. Street-level character. Uh, mysterious, terrific visuals. I mean, that faceless mask, that's brilliant, isn't it? Um, kind of a cleaned-up version of Ditko's Mr. A, uh, who is a real son of a bitch. Now, when, when Denny takes on the character, it's... Um, it's, it's Denny's excuse to basically do Private Eye stuff. And Denny was a big fan of noir and, and Private Eye fiction and, you know, urban-based mysteries. And also, you know, this character is, um, he's flawed. He's, uh, he's got problems. He's not, you know, a white hat hero kind of guy. And, and that's a Denny O'Neill character all the way down the line. Denny, Denny liked these conflicted characters. Um, I once asked Denny if he was a big fan of Have Gun Will Travel. And, and his eyes lit up. And he was like a kid again. And he said, I love that show. I, like, I said, yeah, I know. I, know. I just knew it. Because uh, Paladin, um, the character Richard Boone played, I said, he is so much like one of your characters. He's got this past they only hint at. Uh, he's got this really twisted origin. If you ever watch the show. Uh, the origin is it's pure Denny O'Neill. So I knew that that was a big influence on him. So yeah, the question in Denny's hands is very different than in Ditko's hands. Uh, I like both. Uh, I like both for different reasons. But um, yeah, not the same, not the same. S the same, but not the same. Because Denny certainly didn't break anything. He didn't ruin anything. He didn't fly in the face of what Ditko had created. Uh, he just built on it and kind of made it his own version of that and uh you know and an excuse for him to do you know the urban crime stuff you know the, the lonely guy on the rainy streets of the big city kind of stuff so all right if you need to contact me as i mentioned before you might want to contact me ask me for a script i'll send it to you why not um if you put something in the jar for uh saint jude's i'd be even more likely to send you something you know, a couple of bucks, and I'll send you some. I'll send you a couple of scripts. Why not? Uh, so Bruno Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com is where you want to reach me. It's the most reliable way to submit your questions, suggestions, answers, harangues, rants, you know, slings and arrows, whatever. Send it to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. I check this address a number of times a day. That's where I pull most of your questions from. Now, this campaign is ending soon, sometime next week, I think. This is Graham Nolan's Compass Comics presents Giant Size, Two-Fisted, Manly Tales. It's a hundred big pages of manly, tough guy, badass action. And you want to get in on this. You really do. It's got some of the biggest talents in comics working today. It's got me. It's got Graham. It's got Larry Stroman. Dave Williams, Michael Golden, Mike Barron, Butch Geis, you know, um, Kevin Graveau, and more. You know, we're adding more guys to the roster. It's, it's 100 pages. It's 10 10-page 10 stories of testosterone-fueled, badass action story. Uh, I'm doing a Viking story. That's being drawn by Dave Williams. I've, I've already written it, and I wrote a science fiction story. Uh, for Larry Stroman, and uh, I think you'll dig it. You go over and support. It's it's doing well, but it could still use your help. I would love it if we could get to the 150,000 stretch goal, and this thing will be in hardcover. Because why shouldn't a book about hard men be in hardcover? So uh, check it out. Check it out. I think you will dig it. Um, Anyway, that's it for me this week. I want to thank you for listening, watching, liking, subscribing, spreading the word, uh, your very, very kind words in the comments section. And um, take care, and I'll see every one of you down the road.